Well, how many of you heard the slogan? I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in class. How many heard the slogan, <coughs> uh, the global problems require global solutions? I think just about everybody in the world uh, has heard that. Because the concept of global governance is in the air. Um, leading thinkers tell us uh, today's global issues are too complex uh, for the obsolete nation state system. Sovereignty itself should be redefined as something that's shared or pooled. Now, there's no doubt that globalization uh, will be uh, advancing as the, 21st, as the 21st century progresses. We'll be seeing a lot more of it. The question is. What form will it take? Uh, will it be international relations between nation states, um, or will it be more global or transnational? So traditional internationalism uh, would mean an international, think of that word, uh, relations between states, international. Uh, the term, one term that's often used is transnationalism, and we can think in terms of the transnational uh, railway across, beyond, something that penetrates, something that's within. Um, and then, of course, there's supranationalism, meaning above the nation state. Uh, and globalism is uh, sometimes vague, but it's sort of a combination of, of between supranationalism and transnational, both of those terms are used. Um, John Ruge uh, is at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, leading theorist of international relations, and he was uh, Deputy Secretary to the United Nations. And he described the difference between internationalism, liberal international institutions that took place after World War II, uh, and the modern globalism. And this is Ruge speaking. Simply put, post war institutions, including the United Nations, were built for an international world. But we've entered a global world. International institutions were designed to reduce frictions between states, remember the Cold War and so on. Our challenge today is to devise new inclusive forms of global governance. So that's, uh, that's Ruby, um, and we hear this term more and more, global governance. And I argue in the book that there is a global governance coalition. There are forces in the world promoting global governance, and this is a driver or an actor in world politics. That's a term that's used a lot in international relations. What does it consist of? Well, certainly, you look at uh, the Global Governance Coalition would concern the leadership of the European Union, uh, the top echelons of the United Nations. It would include the dean of many American uh, law schools. The American Bar Association, the ABA, uh, is, they're promoting what they call the global rule of law. So they are uh, very much part of the Global Governance Coalition would obviously include prominent international lawyers and academic experts in international relations, uh, human rights advocates at uh, places like Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International, uh, certainly people that work for the uh, World Bank or the uh, World Trade Organization or the International Monetary Fund, and it certainly includes the CEOs of major uh, global corporations. Also, of course, judges at places like the International Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights. So it includes quite a bit of uh, uh, the world's elite. Um, now, the Global Governance Project is, let's get this straight, it's not a plot for world government. Nobody, very few people are talking today about the creation of world government. They did after World War II, but no one's saying that today. They're talking about global governance. So this is not a plot by the, you know, the Bilderbergers or the Trilateral Commission. It's not secret meetings where you find uh, Dusty, dusty documents on how to control the world. You want to understand what the global governance movement is, go on the website of the American Bar Association. Look at what they say. <clears throat> go on the, bar, on the website of the European Union, of Yale Law School, uh, or the Ford Foundation, uh, which funds uh, quite a bit of the, of the global governance project. Um, and Steve, I think you can start passing out those uh, handouts, and we're going to take a look at something in a minute. But uh, Fortune 500 companies are very much involved in the, in the global movement. Um, its leaders are rather enthusiastic about some of this. The vice president of Coca-Cola in the 1990s said, we are not an American company. Uh, a top executive at Colgate alone said, there's no mindset in this business, it's Colgate, 
that puts this country, the U.S., first. Uh, the CEO of IBM argued in an article in Foreign Affairs uh, that the global corporation should replace the multinational corporation. If you remember the old multinational corporation, his, his argument, uh, the argument of the CEO of IBM was not simply empirical. This is what is. It was normative. What should be. The global corporation should replace the multinational corporation that was housed in the United States and had offices around the world, but it was essentially an American corporation. The idea here is it's not an American corporation, it's a global corporation. Okay, I have this handout here. Uh, and uh, this is an ad in Foreign Affairs from New York University, um, the Center for Global Affairs of New York University. Uh, so let's take a look at this and Think about what this means for men. The reason I had it handed out, <clears throat> it helps um, clarify the distinction between international relations and, well, actually, it, it blurs the distinction between traditional internationalism, international relations, and globalism. Sort of blurs that distinction between international politics and global politics. So the words, to whom do we pledge allegiance? obviously evokes the iconic language of patriotism and affirmation of the language of the pledge of allegiance to the flag and so on, uh, the affirmation of American national identity, a central right of America's civic religion. Uh, the question mark uh, at the end is obviously meant to challenge or to problematize uh, the concept of national loyalty. In fact, while the global citizen is affirmed, the American citizen sort of disappears in this ad so I call this language uh, as transgressive of national symbols. Now, let's say they were challenged. The officials at NYU say, what kind of ad is this? And uh, somebody could complain or something. And the officials at NYU would probably say, well, we were a, you know, we're a global university. We're open all. We have many uh, foreign students here. We're not strictly an American institution. All this is obviously true, partly true. Uh, but you could argue that the majority of students are American uh, graduates, and the university receives funds from the U.S. Congress specifically authorized to strengthen American foreign policy interests. So if, let's say, let's go back in time, let's say the NYU Center was run by internationalists as opposed to the globalists, they would say, well, America has been a, a world leader since 1945, so our curriculum is focused on America's role in world affairs. That's how we're, we're devising this. Everybody is welcome. We certainly are glad to have foreign students and all kinds of students. Uh, but a realistic view of, of international relations would, and the way we, we would like to do it is to focus on America's role in world affairs as a, as a center. So it's not a question, obviously, they're American citizens and they're foreign citizens. The, the, nation, the citizens retain a nationality, but they are, they are uh, global affair. The, the actual affairs and issues are something else. But I thought this was a very interesting ad. I mean, you could run it, you could create it in a couple of different ways. Uh, but in, in a way that sort of uh, shows a difference between, say, the post war internationalist viewpoint and, and uh, how uh, international relations has uh, somewhat evolved. Um, so uh, global governance, in a way, for many theorists, uh, suggests a different type of nation state. Uh, the global governance project does not, uh, does not envision the disappearance of the nation state. Some people say, well, the nation state is disappearing. And nobody's seriously saying that. It's not disappearing, but it is being demoted, in the words of one international law professor. There's a, sort of a demotion of the status of the nation state. Uh, it doesn't have as much sovereignty or authority as it did before. It still performs many of the important functions of governance, but there's also another layer, a higher authority, a range of supranational institutions, laws, rules, and norms that constitute a higher authority. Uh, Robert Cooper was a British diplomat, and he's currently a diplomat with the European Union. They either use their external service or their foreign service. Uh, and he wrote, he wrote the sort of theoretical doctrine on it, and uh, Cooper said, well, there's different types of state. The United States and China, those are modern states. They exercise full sovereignty. 
Places like Somalia and Sudan are, are pre-modern states. They haven't quite reached the modern stage. And the states of Europe are postmodern states. And you describe postmodern states, this is a direct quote from Cooper, that postmodern states are states that quote, share or pool sovereignty and interfere in each other's domestic policy right down to the regulation of beer and sausages. Cooper says that's what we do in the European Union. And uh, that's true to an extent. Uh, the European Union is a, is a good model of, of uh, transnational governments. Uh, both friends and foes of the European Union agree it has a democracy deficit. Joseph Fischer, former German foreign minister, uh, strong supporter of the U European Union, wants to move it, says there's a democracy deficit, he wants to move it toward a European nation state. And that's one of the views, and the others are more power for the, uh, for the other uh, institutions of the European Union. Now, technically, uh, power is supposed to reside with the nation states through the Council of Ministers. Uh, there's also a European Parliament, which is, has, is supposed to represent the citizens. The Council of Ministers is supposed to represent uh, the nation states. And then the European Commission is the administrative body, sort of the bureaucracy. But actually, uh, most of the authority today is with the European Commission, even technically. Legislation in the European Union originates in the European Commission, which is, in the, which is the bureaucracy. It doesn't represent originate in the parliament or in, uh, in the council. Uh, in fact, um, well, the power of the council and the parliament is, is negative. They can say, no, we don't, we don't like that. We, we're going to block this legislation that's being offered in bureaucracy. They have never done that so far. The parliament has never uh, stopped a uh, legislation proposed by the European bureaucracy. Um, uh, so that's, that's the situation in it now. And, and uh, uh, say you're a British citizen, uh, and you elect a member of parliament. I mean, traditionally, or since uh, in the 20th century, uh, power in Britain has been solely in the House of Lords, by the House of Commons. They don't even share too much with the House of Lords anymore. Um, but today, only about 50% of the laws, British laws, are made in uh, by the House of Commons. 50% of their other laws are uh, made in Brussels. Uh, I had a conversation with the Deputy Ambassador of the, United, of the European Union uh, to the United States and asked him what percentage of laws are from overall in Europe are originated in Brussels and what uh, percentage come from in various parliaments in Sweden and France. So he said 60-80% of the laws are Brussels. This is from the Deputy Ambassador. 60-80% of the laws are initiated from Brussels, from the bureaucracy, and the remaining are from the national parliament. So I call this sort of situation sort of post-democratic, not post-modern. Post-modern then becomes post-democratic. Uh, it wasn't supposed to be this way. Uh, European Union found 1958, the original Treaty of Rome, uh, described the European, well at that time it was the European Commission, the European uh, <coughs> Community, the EC, described the EC as a international organization. Well, it's become both, it's become trans and so forth. What happened was essentially uh, <clears throat> judicial supremacy was established by the European Court of Justice. Uh, there were a series of cases in the early 1960s, uh, cases that would make sense probably to everybody in this room. They would, companies were trying to do business, you know, Dutch company trying to do business in Germany, they're getting all sorts of regulations obviously designed to thwart them and prevent them from doing business. So they appeal to the European Court of Justice. The European Court of Justice, sort of a Marbury Madison of the European Union, said we have uh, supremacy here. We have supremacy, and uh, we're overriding laws of the national parliaments, like 1964, uh, the French Parliament, the Dutch Parliament. So they sort of slow, they did this in a series of cases in the 60s and established uh, judicial supremacy. Probably in cases that made uh, quite a bit of sense. Uh, but in, in a substance sense, what they've done now is uh, overthrow democratic parliaments. Uh, and this is a supranational court, and there's really no little check on the, on the European Court of Justice. Uh, now, the Europeans are subject to other courts. Uh, take Britain again. It's a member of the Council of Europe. <clears throat> Those are 50 countries. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Britain and all the other European countries signed the 
European Convention on Human Rights in 1950. And, the, and the, the check on the European Convention on Human Rights comes from the European Court of Human Rights. It's in Strasbourg. It's another court. It's not an EU court. It's a court of the Council of Europe, European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. So recently, British Britain had this terrorist from Jordan. He was convicted. They wanted to send him back to Jordan. Uh, he appealed his case to the European Court of Human Rights. They said, you can't send him back. So the British didn't send him back. So this is another supranational court that, you know, our, 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 at this point, subordinate to. There was also, there's a big issue now in Britain of felons voting. This is not people who've served their time or been out. This is currently serving felons. Uh, so the British uh, European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg said you have to let these people vote. It's an internet, it's a universal human right. You signed the treaty, it's a universal treaty of human, European treaty of human rights, European Convention. And the British Parliament said no, that's not, we want to be punished. They can go, but as a felon, they can go later when they get out. Um, so that case is sort of a death row. That's clear exactly what's going to happen. But this is, uh, this is the new transnational politics. Um, and there's many advocates uh, across, um, uh, many advocates here. I'll mention two of them. Uh, Anne Marie Slaughter, uh, well known professor. Uh, she's currently the head of the Washington Think Tank. She's just become head of the New America Foundation. She was um, head of the Office of Policy and Planning in the State Department. Office of Policy and Planning, it's the in-house State Department, the in-house think tank. That was one headed by George Kennan. You remember George Kennan, the Cold War doctor. He headed the Office of Policy. It's a famous office and sort of the in-house think tank. She wrote a book uh, called A New Global Order, and Slaughter explicitly proposed a global governance system in which national governance would cede a degree of sovereignty. I'll give a quote here. Quote, to transnational government, I'm sorry, transgovernmental networks at the, at the horizontal level and supranational institutions at the vertical level. So horizontally, that would mean Democrat judges, congressmen, parliamentarians, regulators. You meet with your counterparts in other countries and sort of come up with joint policies, coordinate policies, which should be in the intermediates between, between uh, Western legislators and, uh, and regulators and judges and so on. And vertically, of course, that means up. So this would be ceding sovereign authority, and she mentioned specifically, to supranational institutions on important global issues such as the International Criminal Court. Slaughter maintains that global governance networks can improve many functions of a world government, legislation, administration, and adjudication, judicial, without the form. Therefore, a quote here, creating a um, Sort of a new uh, world order out of horizontal and vertical networks, creating a genuine global rule of law, global rule of law <clears throat> that could constrain government officials of every nation, every nation, democratic and non democratic. <clears throat> uh, Slaughter stated that uh, on another occasion that national governments um, would not have to be democratic to be in sort of this global network. North Korea would be ruled out, it's too isolated, but the Islamic Republic of, of Iran could be a possible participant in these global networks. Uh, <clears throat> Harold Coe was, go on to Harold Coe, he was the dean of Yale Law School, he's back as a regular professor, but he served the uh, last couple of years as, as the legal advisor, uh, the chief legal advisor to the State Department, giving the sort of interpreting international law for the, uh, for the president and for the administration. He's been mentioned as a possible Supreme Court nominee. Co wrote a detailed article in the Stanford Law Review in 2003. He said, quote, American lawyers, scholars, and activists should trigger a transnational legal process of transnational interactions that will generate legal interpretations that it can, that it can in turn be internalized into domestic law of even resistant nation states. Uh, he says that human, says human rights advocates should litigate not just in domestic courts, but simultaneously before foreign and international arenas. He would also encourage foreign governments, such as Mexico and transnational NGOs, to challenge the United States on human rights issues. He mentioned specifically uh, the death penalty is a possible violation of human rights, so wait to challenge the U.S. in foreign courts. Um, and 
Um, <clears throat> this would also include uh, supporters of the International Criminal Court. Now, uh, the problem with Coe's transnational legal process that I see it is that some of this process is outside the normal process of American constitutional democracy. American people have a constitution, judicial institutions, and democratic political institutions. So these transnational interactions, such as appealing to foreign courts, uh, would be outside of the meaning, I think, of the phrase, we the people of the United States. Uh, they could be characterized as sort of post-constitutional or perhaps post-democratic. Uh, but they clearly raise us questions of constitutional legitimacy and political authority and so on that we have to talk about. Um, now, at the end of the day, uh, a lot of this, this conflict between the nation state and global governance will be fought out in a lot of sort of pragmatic considerations that will play a role. I'll take a look briefly at the International Criminal Court. Um, uh, the International Criminal Court. The United States has not joined the International Criminal Court, um, but the, Internet, the International Criminal Court claims jurisdiction over all nation states, or over nation states that are not a part of the court if the war crime or the crime was committed on the soil of a country that joined the International Criminal Court. So the United States has not joined the treaty, but if Afghanistan, for example, has, so if American soldiers commit what is going to some people want to investigate as a war crime, technically, well, they haven't done this yet, it was just an investigation, the International Criminal Court could uh, <coughs> claims authority over American soldiers. <coughs> the supporters, of course, say, well, wait a minute, there's a safeguard. There's a situation, there's the uh, position of complementarity that's in the ICC treaty, the International Criminal Court treaty. Complementarity says the country involved could try their own soldiers first. <coughs> but, if they say they don't like the trial, say these American soldiers from Afghanistan were tried and acquitted, they could say, well, this was, they tried these people, but it really wasn't a fair trial. Uh, they were unwilling or unable to have a fair trial. So then the ICC claims final authority uh, to try the soldiers. So that's one of the, sort of one of the problems. It's not just American soldiers. It was, there are uh, several democratic countries have not, not members of the International Criminal Court, Israel, um, the Czech Republic, uh, Indonesia, which is the world's largest Muslim democracy, uh, the Philippines, some other countries. And they don't have, uh, they, they have, of course, less power than the United States to, to support themselves. So the complementary pol policy wouldn't uh, work in all cases. But this shows a problem. Um, <clears throat> but it shows, it shows a problem of, of democratic principles. One other problem with it is there's about 150 members of the course, and a good a good chunk of these are um, members of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, are from non-democratic countries. Of course, they run the administration. It's their, their treaty. So they choose the judges. So you would have technically a situation where judges from, from dictatorships were judging uh, the troops from democratic countries. So you have a, a problem of, you know, say, say India had, this is, a very, this is actually a possibility, uh, India had it was a peacekeeping mission in the Congo, which did sign the treaty, Indian troops were Charged with war crimes, India has a trial, troops are acquitted, and the ICC couldn't step into this case. So uh, it's one of the reasons that India is very suspicious. So um, the ICC, in my view, is not necessarily a good idea that's sort of hard to put into practice, but um, in many ways it contains a lot of bad ideas or ideas that um, are not, is if you're a small, if you're a small D Democrat, uh, the ICC is a problem then for for democratic accountability. Um, uh, but this is, um, uh, I want to mention one other thing on that, which I didn't mention in the class today. But, uh, uh, and that's that, um, what is a war crime? I mean, there's a big, you think we know, and the first of the ICC was to, um, after Nuremberg, okay, we know what the Nazis did. I mean, we don't want this to happen again. Or, we certainly want the per perpetrators brought to justice. So that was the original idea. So um, now, or the, the, IC, the ICC said, well, we're, we're following standard international law, which was developed by the Geneva Convention. Okay, we all remember the Geneva Convention. We've all, been, we've all seen the uh, you know, sort of World War II movies where they talk about the Geneva Convention and so on. Well, the Geneva Convention was altered drastically in 1977. Uh, and they, they added additional protocol one. 
Uh, I'll give you two examples of additional protocol one, um, which are now considered war crimes. Uh, one is additional protocol one was pushed through, it was a treaty, was strongly supported by what was then called the third world, now the developing world, because of the situation in South Africa. Swapo and you know the African National Congress was fighting the apartheid government, so they wanted to give more support to guerrillas. Also, they wanted to give more support to Palestinians uh, who were fighting in Israel and still are, but this was in the 70s. Um, so they wanted to give some more support to sort of um, developing countries, uh, guerrilla movers. So they, they made a couple of provisions, and one was before this to be a legitimate combatant, you had to be in uniform and you had to be part of a, a normal command structure. Otherwise, you're an illegitimate command. Uh, without a trial, this sort of thing. Uh, or you went with a trial, but you wouldn't be you wouldn't be to go under a regular, you wouldn't be part of the regular military. You wouldn't have the privileges that you have in the military. Okay, so what, what's changed in um, in 1977 in additional protocol one uh, is that you you don't have to be in uniform now, and there's a situation where you could be. Um, so you're not in uniform, you're a, an insurgent, you have a weapon, your weapon is, you're hiding your weapon, you're in a civilian crowd, at that point you are a civilian, you cannot be touched. You jump out of the crowd, you fire on the, you, you show your weapon, you fire on the congressional forces, at that point you're a combatant, so they can fire back at you and so on. You jump back into the crowd, at that point you're a civilian again. Uh, they can't, they fire at the crowd, of course, they're firing on civilians, so that's what we're doing. Uh, they're firing at you, you're a civilian at that point. Um, if they come and get you, they're dragging a civilian out, they're not dealing with a combatant. Uh, so that, that is, that's one of the problems that the United States did not ratify, that was rejected by the Reagan administration. Uh, additional protocol was signed by President Carter, but was rejected by the Reagan administration, and it was backed by the editorials of the New York Times and the Washington Post supported the Reagan administration position at that time. Uh, not to uh, not to adhere to uh, uh, protocol one. So that's one. And the other one, the other provision. There's a lot of provisions that are problematic. The other one sort of stands out. Is you, before a, an air attack or before bombardment, you're supposed to. There might be civilians in the area, so you're supposed to warn the civilians. Um, so the United States bombed uh, Belgrade. Well, this is under the Clinton administration, 1999. They did not warn. It bombed a radio station that killed some civilians. They didn't warn civilians in advance, so there was a question whether this was a war crime. And there was a temporary investigation that didn't proceed by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. But they said the United States violated. Human Rights Watch said the United States is a war crime in the United States. They violated additional Protocol 1. The United States is not a party to Protocol 1, and there's the question of state's consent. You're supposed to consent to our international law. They said, well, this is, but many NATO countries did. This was a NATO operation. Uh, many NATO countries are do adhere to Protocol 1, so therefore the United States was covered. Another case in Gaza when Israel attacked uh, Hamas terrorists in Gaza, they did actually do a warning in Gaza. They said uh, there's going to be, we'll say that's between 10th Street and 30th Street, there's going to be an attack, and so they drop leaflets. Civilians should get out of the way. Um, so some civilians did leave, but then they made the attack. And then the Goldstone Report, which came from the United Nations Human Rights Council, criticized Israel for war crimes because they violated additional protocol one by not warning civilians. They, the, the, the warning was too general. They just said there's going to be an attack in this area, get out of the way. They didn't give the time of the attack, and they didn't give the target of the attack. This is in the Goldstone Report. So they obviously violated this violated, uh, human rights. So this is, I mean, these are, this is the fruits of. Um, what is not followed by the International Criminal Court, um, which is not, you know, this is not Nuremberg, this is not Nuremberg, this is not Auschwitz. They're, they're supposed to follow the most egregious crimes, but they're not doing that. Currently, they're, the current case is on a Kenya, a, uh, a election violence in Kenya, which killed three people, and there were thugs on both sides. So the, the Kenyan parliament is so outrageous they voted to leave the International Criminal Court. But again, this is not the purpose of the original. Noise about Nuremberg, this is the purpose. We're, we're not going back to that. So, okay. Uh, we could say, in a way, that the advocates of international, <coughs> of global governance in general, and the International Criminal Court were answered by John Locke in the Second Treatise of Civil Government. And uh, I'll quote Locke and then do some paraphrase. 
uh, Lot quote, quote uh, Lot 1689, the delivery also of the people into the subjugation of a foreign power, either by the prince or by the legislative, is certainly a change of the legislative, and so a dissolution of government for the end by the people entered into society, being to be preserved an entire, free, independent society to be governed by their own laws, this is lost whenever they are given up into the power of another. So in 21st century language, the legislative could be thought of as a democratic process, the transfer of sovereign authority to an outside supranational authority, the European Union, the International Criminal Court, whatever, changes the nation of a, the nature of a previously independent society. Uh, Abraham Lincoln defined sovereignty as a political community uh, without a political superior. Uh, so in the situations I described, in a sense, uh, there is a political superior over this nation. There is a supernatural court. Now, um, supporters, uh, the sophisticated supporters of global governments are aware of this democracy. They're aware of this stuff. They're aware of the, of the, of the, of the critics. Of the, you know, they call us the new sovereignists, people like myself and, and uh, Professor Rapkin and uh, Jack Goldsmith at Harvard and, and uh, Curtis Bradley at Duke, who are sort of you know, uh, critics, and John Bolton, you know, which is you know, results of a uh, critic of global uh, government. So they're aware of this problem, and so they want to sort of get around it. So there's this democracy problem. So how, how do we get around this problem? Uh, they have attempted to answer it. Um, uh, we have some IR specialists here. Everybody knows John Eikenberry is one of the leading theorists of international relations in the United States. Um, and he asked a question. He asked this question openly. He says, can the authority of, an, of the international community be strengthened, which, you know, is a good thing, without sacrificing constitutional democracy at home? That's the unresolved problem of the international project. And so Eikenberry continues, how do nations reconcile the vision of increasing authority lodged above the nation state where they're sharing and pooling of sovereignty with domestic liberal democracy built on popular sovereignty? So that's the problem. He doesn't quite, he gives an ambiguous answer, which I'm not going to read. It's a long, ambiguous answer. He doesn't quite answer the question, but he does have some footnotes. He does point us to, he said, well, some people have grappled with this problem, particularly it's also other people, names that you, IR specialists would have heard, of course, uh, Robert Cohen and Joseph Nye are among the people who, who've uh, wrestled with this problem and gives out a couple of footnotes. So instead of following the money, uh, let's follow the footnotes. Uh, so Nye and Cohen are talking about, so they're talking about the problem of democratic accountability in global government. So how do what do we do? So we talked about well we there's a we have to there's the redefining of accountability. That's the name of the article, Re, redefining accountability. So what is the purpose of redefining accountability is to provide legitimacy uh, to global institutions. Uh, the question is legitimacy. How do we how do we develop legit, uh, where is legitimacy? Now of course he makes the concept that legitimacy. Uh, comes from a different variety of sources, so he gives some resources. It comes from epistemic communities. It comes from blends of states, international organizations, transnational actors that are focused around an international regime, a set of rules established to govern a set of issues. That could be other you know, people, the lawyers working on the International Criminal Court, among others, uh, but epistemic communities. Uh, epistemic, of course, knowledge, so knowledge-based communities, so presumably people with, with um, a deeper knowledge of some of these issues. Cohen uh, writes that the consent of democratic states is not sufficient for legitimacy because these states often disregard the interests of foreigners. Cohen says also that the limitations of the democratic channel, um, let's see, how does he say it? Given, given, he says, given the limitations of the democratic channel, legitimacy comes from external epistemic actors. External epistemic actors. Um, so who would they be? Um, 
well, we can we can think about it and, and for a moment. For before we we get to that, um, I'll, I'll continue with some of Paul Haynes' comments. Uh, he says he continues, "quote The United States, especially, needs to be held externally accountable because its internal democracy cannot be counted on to defend the interests of the weak peoples whom U.S. action may harm." Well, that's true. Um, so then he also says, the United States notes, I mean, Cohen notes, that an external accountability is a greater problem for democratic states than non-democratic states. He mentions two in particular, the United States and Israel. Uh, because, his quote, arrogance has been reinforced by the claim of the political elites in the U.S. and Israel to derive their support from that most virtuous of sources, the demos, the people. Uh, okay. Cohen never mentions, of course, that the external epistemic actors, uh, they might have their own special interest agenda, as possible. Uh, for example, international lawyers who uh, litigate before the World Trade Organization. Uh, they would be epistemic external actors, they would be experts in world trade, a specialist in international finance who played before the uh, International Monetary Fund, um, who are working for global companies. They certainly would be epistemic external actors. They would be epistemic, they have the knowledge, probably more knowledge than most, more knowledge than your average congressman or British member of the House of Parliament. They would certainly be more knowledgeable. Um, certainly, international lawyers uh, that were litigated for the International Criminal Court, or as I said, the WTO, working for corporations. They would all be a lot more knowledgeable. So, um, Cohen, however, does not mention that they might have their own agenda, a special interest agenda. Nor does Cohen acknowledge that arrogance could be a characteristic of some external epistemic actors, as well as the political elites of democratic states. Uh, that he singles out and he doesn't mention the other one. So, I think you get the idea of what I'm getting at here. Um, but I'm not sure the epistemic, external epistemic actors and operating new epistemic community solves the democratic deficit uh, problem. But uh, many, of course, uh, many argue that, well, the argument, well, wait, wait, okay, so, you know, relax. Globalization in some form serves the interests of America. This is the kind of world we want, a rule-based world. This is the argument that's needed, that's put forward. It's consistent with American values. Uh, with American interest. What's needed is effective American leadership and engagement to sort of create this world. Uh, for one particular reason, it's mentioned a lot, is that America might be top dog now, but it's not going to be forever. China and other nations are emerging. So it'd be a good idea to set the rules in place now to get the Chinese elites to internalize this notion of global governance, global rule. So they would internalize it. Um, and then follow it uh, when they become leaders in 30, 40 years from now, and then the rules would be in place. Um, that's sort of much one of the arguments put forth. I suggest this argument is flawed on realist and moralist grounds. On realist grounds, is once a power uh, becomes a world power, they usually put their own rules in effect. They don't follow the rules uh, that somebody else was, some previous power. Uh, France or Britain, I think of who they are, put in power uh, 40 years ago. They usually, uh, uh, it's a, I think, a utopian premise to suggest that uh, we could internalize a world order now that would be in place uh, in 40 to 50 years uh, when these other forces uh, become uh, much stronger. Uh, so I think that that's sort of a, on the realist grounds, it's not realistic. But let's look at some of the, the moral issues, the, the normative issues involved here. And a um, major point of my book was that the, essentially that the, the global, the conflict between global co governance and nation states concerns the oldest questions of politics. Going back to, uh, to Aristotle, who governs, who should govern? And this is not a new question. It was discussed by uh, Aristotle and his, his student, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquered the known world. He said, this is great. Conquered the world. I brought peace to the world. This is what we want, world government. Aristotle said, well, you know, there was this polis and the city state of Athens, and there was a different form, and maybe there was a better form of government. It depends. I'm not sure the world government's best. Dante 
advocated world government. We've heard this. Uh, and Kant, uh, Kant, of course, talked about a federation of democracies, federal republics was his term, uh, that would establish sort of a, a world order. So this, this, this idea is not going away. There is uh, uh, there are a few people talking today about a world parliament, not too many motions to world government. But the idea of some type of peaceful global order, that's never going away. That would be here four or five hundred years. This argument then is not going to uh, disappear. But so it's a fundamental question. And the fundamental question beneath the struggle is, do self-constituted peoples have the moral right to rule themselves? That's really a basic question. Um, and more than 200 years ago, the founders of the American Republic had their own answer to this question that led to the American Revolution. In the Declaration of Independence, the Second Constitutional Congress complained to our British brethren, that was their word, of the quote, as is the quote from the Declaration, Attem they complained of, the att of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarranted jurisdiction over us. They, com they, com they charged that George III, King George III, quote, has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution. Of course, the Constitution obviously was the British Constitution, 1776 and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. Um, so they were complaining about it. So often I'm in debates with people who are espousing a globalist, and Professor Coe has responded to our, our um, foreign policy, our foreign affairs piece, so we're gonna send a letter responding to him. But one of the complaints that Joyce here as well, the American founders talked about a decent respect for the opinion of man. So you know, what are you talking about? So I'm saying yes, they did, and they should. And America should follow international law. But it's international law that, uh, uh, that is based on traditional international national law, which is consent of the state, state consent. So international law that we consent to. The United States, yes, it does believe in, in universal human rights. Um, uh, it does, it does, it does um, in fact, in, in the Declaration, I'll just say a word here on what they meant by decent respect for the things of mankind, that we're revolting from Britain, we're 18th century gentlemen, we're explaining our views, so this is this we're giving this to the world. We're not going to change our views. We're not going to stop the revolution if we had a problem from France or Spain. We're not getting approval from you. Uh, I mean, you don't have a veto. We would like your, your moral approval. So as I say, yes, we do believe in universal human rights. But the key question is, as always, who decides? Who decides first? Who decides exactly what those rights, what exactly who defines the rights? You know, it's where the American Congress of the International Criminal Court. Second, it's how to deal with violations of those rights and exactly what those rights are. And in the United States, these issues are decided and defined by a constitutional system with an explicit bill of rights. The constitutional order ensures individual human rights and provides for the punishment of those who violate specific human rights. It's all based on government by consent of the government. The advocates of global governance have a different answer to the same question. Who defines and who decides human rights? For now, the content of human rights is defined and decided by a growing and evolving body of new international law, by international and transnational institutions, by epistemic communities, uh, by experts in this. Um, so the global governance approach, in my view, is not based on consent of the government most directly involved. After one is stripped away the verbiage, transnational litigation process, shared or pooled sovereignty, global civil society, coordinating constitutional rules with the rules of foreign international law, redefining sovereignty, redefining accountability, external epistemic actors, creating new international treaty regimes, global solutions to global problems, etc. cetera. Um, after this has all been stripped away, what the supporters of global governments are really saying is that Americans, Czechs, Indonesians, Chileans, and all the others any other self-constituted people do not really, in the final analysis, have a moral right to rule themselves. On the contrary, my book says, in this lecture, and I write in this book and elsewhere, I say they do. So that's where I'll end. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I'd like to take up the democracy question, because uh, uh, I wouldn't consider the American democracy to be in such great shape right now, anyway. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've got surveillance, we've got uh, a variety of other challenges 
uh, the money and the politics and the like. Okay, so um, it would seem to me that the, that the global governance project uh, does uh, have elements of strengthening democracy, including at the national level, uh, because if there's anything that challenges democracy, it has to be the militarization of society. The United States, of course, has the largest defense budget in the world and global reach. And a more peaceful international system uh, could then reduce the level of military tensions and thus the threat that militarization uh, creates for democratic government around the world, not just the United States. So I wonder if you could respond to that. Uh, yes, I, uh, that's certainly a good idea in theory, but. I don't think the current, I don't see the, how they're doing this. I don't, I don't, the International Criminal Court uh, uh, is making more peace. In fact, as I said in your class, I'll repeat this because it's sort of interesting. Um, and it, it relates directly to your question. Uh, one of the questions of the International Criminal Court, and this came up in a lot of places like the Sudan, and most of their activities are in Africa. That's most of the, the war crimes people are who their connection get a hold of are in, are in Africa. And a lot of these countries are undergoing tremendous turbulence, so you have a dictator. And you, and you have this in South Africa, I mean, uh, with the apartheid regime. And you have, you have an oppressive government, and they oppress people. And then the dictator's overthrown, or in the case of South Africa, uh, the apartheid government was overthrown. Uh, and then the global governance, justice people, and this includes Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, so okay, we want we want justice now for these people. You know, these people were the perpetrators, which makes sense. That's, that's a reasonable position. Uh, and South Africa said, decided we're going to have a truth and reconciliation process. Uh, Chile decided after the junta was overthrown, and Argentina the same thing. We're going to have a truth and reconciliation process. We want to know what happened. We want these people who committed these crimes to come forward. We want them to you know, apologize to the relatives. We want we want a cleansing. Uh, we don't want a permanent civil war in this country. We don't want permanent permanent war. So they had these uh, they had these truth sessions, these truth and uh, reconciliation sessions. So the secret police and uh, places like our pipeline in South Africa and in Argentina and Chile and some other countries of Africa came forward and said, "Yeah, I was, I was in charge of the secret police. I killed 50 people. I, yeah, I kidnapped your aunt and killed her. And I'm sorry. Uh, this is." Realize this is why I, I confess, and this is what I did. These people were given amnesty, which you know was not, it wasn't justice in some sense, but it provided peace for the country, and the, the country just, it was, it was the decision of the democratic process in these countries that we want to solve this problem through a truth and reconciliation process. And this is going on now, and these groups, the uh, human, human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, said no, these people are criminals, and they should be tried. Uh, so they, were, they wanted to press ahead, the International Criminal Court said that against the wishes of the state, which was used to be a dictatorship, now it's trying to become a democracy, and one of the ways was to move on and to put this stuff behind us, and say, we're going to do this amnesty, we're going to amnesty these people, and we're going to try to bring peace, and we know there's, justice is not going to be fully served, because these people are going to sort of get away with, they're not going to be executed, they're not going to be served life in prison, but this is a way of, of Healing the wounds of society. This is peace, and so peace it was in came into conflict with justice. And global governance has taken both sides. Of this. I mean, you can, uh, the global governance, judicial people, the NGOs that promote global justice, and our main target now is actually is the United States and Israel. It seems to be the main target of human rights watch and Amnesty International, but they promote it. Uh, they were, you know, pressing ahead against the truth and reconciliation work. So. Um, that's part of my answer. Uh, my other answer is I don't, uh, um, I don't see this. Or how would you, would you have a disarmament commission? Like, I mean, the, the extent of what you call it, militarization in the United States, it looks like it's partially working now with the sequester. It looks like there's congressional action that actually is, at this point, actually reducing uh, the military. Most European countries have reduced their military. Uh, Israel hasn't, and they have a direct uh, challenge. Uh, Countries that are increasing their military are China, uh, Iran, uh, Russia. So I don't know how this would be achieved. I have your suggestion. I don't know how I understand the motivation, I understand what you're saying, but I don't, 
no, if there's a global inst governance institution that would be successful in demilitarizing or having less military forces in the world, how would that be achieved? But you can answer the question. How would that be achieved? Well, I, I, I was going to the quote that you provided earlier, yeah. in which uh, the objective seems to be to embed countries in a system of international law. Mm -hmm. And that may well not always be compatible with the country itself has decided to do, but the idea is that there ought to be a single governance system worldwide that should, by its very existence, reduce many of the sources of tension among the countries. So it's a much bigger project. Yeah, well, we have the United Nations, that was one of the purposes of the United Nations. Yeah, it's a much bigger project, I think, than the ICC. Well, right. the UN would be part of it. The UN is, it's, well, that was part of the purpose of the UN, that obviously hasn't. Right. Done on this at all. It is a talking chat, it does serve some purposes. Uh, that has reduced it. It has probably helped in some conflicts or certain conflicts with us. Um, so that's that's a positive thing. And I'm all absolutely in favor of, of um, U.S. fulfilling its obligations and in international law and even building it up to an extent. But international law should be based on state consent. To have it, that's, that's a, a primary principle of international law, the law of nations. The founders saw it should be based on the consent of, of states. Thank you, sir. It, it seems to me that there is no realistic hope that strengthening uh, international institutions is going to go anywhere towards strengthening democracies and, and of member states. Um, in, in part, I think, for the reason that democratic states are by far, I think, a very small minority of international states um, and don't operate in a democratic form anyway. Further, I think the, the destruction or the, the deterioration of democracy in this country is not based upon the, the demerits of a democratic state or a republican form of government but it's based primarily in the faithlessness of our leaders in failing to do such basic things as observe the rule of law, protect private property, um, honor uh, contractual obligations. I, I see no hope for globalization going anywhere near improving our state of liberty, but only improving our state of suppression and tyranny. So, and, and I dare say, Professor Coe um, is not likely to be one who can show us a pathway away from that kind of dismal end. Uh, and I'm very concerned that he might become a judge of the Supreme Court. Good Lord. Uh, with, with the recent change in the Senate's rules. Well, he did say, um, when he was confirmed as uh, chief legalizer of the State Department, and he had uh, 34 votes against him. So he said, he joking, he said, well, if I was a treaty, I wouldn't have been confirmed. But he would, I guess now, with the new filibuster tool which just passed uh, uh, today, apparently, uh, he might be uh, confirmed with, uh, with 50 votes. Well, you're talking about a slightly different issue of uh, internal problems within republics and democracies, which obviously the founding fathers were very interested in, that, that, in the founding of the American Republic, they, they were very concerned about Rome and what they were concerned about was Republican Rome. I mean, the fall of Republican Rome became an empire building up these military forces as part of it, and the rest was disobeying the rule of law and so on. So this was the collapse of a republic, and that sort of has happened throughout history. So the United States and other countries are new to it. Um, but that's certainly true. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I have one question, but I'm probably will phrase it awkwardly. Um, so in Western civilization, you can kind of look at it as two different languages of liberty. One, which was the British tradition that we kind of embraced and at least originally attempted to take to its logical conclusion. And there's the French version of liberty, which centers around two notions of who is sovereign. Uh, continental Europe seems to be embracing the idea that a particular elite is sovereign, 
whereas the British tradition seems to be saying that the individual is sovereign. And so could it be fair to recast a transnational debate versus you know, the Westphalian nation state stances as one, uh, the individual is still sovereign versus just another form of an autocratic despotism? Yeah, I would say that was phrased very, very well. Uh, and it raises a bunch of points, actually. Um, um, yeah, I think you're basically going that would essentially agree with most of that. Um, in fact, in the book, uh, I make a point of saying, we talk about Westphalian sovereignty, because that's the classic international relations term from the Treaty of Westphalia, 1648, and the religious wars. So you, you can't have these Catholic Protestant wars anymore. Let's just have a, let's, the religion should be decided by the sovereign, and the nation states should decide these things. So sovereignty is with the sovereign Treaty of Westphalia. So Europeans and most people think of sovereignty as this is Westphalian sovereignty, but the global governments people are criticizing this Westphalian sovereignty. And in the book, I have a couple of, you know, in the page or so. Well, Americans don't think of themselves as Westphalian, part of Westphalian sovereignty. There's no American at all. They were part of the Westphalian sovereignty system, unless they're maybe our professor. They don't think of Westphalian sovereignty. What do they think of? Uh, they think of sovereignty, and you're saying individual. I'd say it resides in the people. We, the people of the United States, are sovereign. So they think that instead of Westphalian sovereignty, of Philadelphian sovereignty. So that's a term that I should have coined in the book that uh, the sovereignty of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution from Philadelphia, in which, yeah, the people are sovereign, it's not the state. Uh, and West Bay would say the sovereign state. So it's not the state that are sovereign, but it's the people, and they can withdraw their uh, approval from, uh, from the state. They're, they're the ones that are ultimately sovereign. Uh, so that's the difference between Philadelphia and West Bay sovereign. Your other point that we sort of teased in there was negative liberty and positive liberty. Uh, that's absolutely right. The Anglo-American tradition is negative about liberty. Liberty is the government can't. This is what the government can't do to you. Positive liberty is what the government can do for you. Um, and most of the human rights treaties, there, it's all based on basically on positive liberty. I was talking about that today in John's class um, about um, the CEDAW Treaty the, um, and the. Um, I think that's the UN Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and a little bit on the Disabled Treaty, UN Treaty on the Disabled, UN Treaty on uh, Children. And all of these treaties are, uh, are positive. They're all put in terms of positive rights. So a UN Monitoring Committee, like was monitoring up, I, the United States is not a part of any of these treaties, because we, at this point, a good part of the Senate thinks it interferes with American domestic affairs. Well, the, in the Children's Treaty, the UN Monitors went to Ireland, because I'm Ireland's a member of the treaty, and said, okay, let's look at your budget. What percent of your budget do you spend on children's issues? Uh, you know, you have children, 20% uh, of Ireland, you spend 20% of your budget. So it was positive. How much of your budget are you spending on this? Uh, and the Women's Treaty, uh, the CEDAW Treaty, the UN Committee went to Britain, um, and said, okay, you have a you know, parliament of 500 members. What percentage? Women are 50% of the country, why aren't they 15%? Of the, uh, of the seats in Harlem. Um, they went to Norway and said, well, you have this parity in the parliament, that's good, but your corporations, your private corporations are different. And your, your boards of directors of private corporations are not 50% women, there's a small amount of 10%. How are you going to get that off to Norway change its law to be in compliance? It wasn't forced on them, but they thought this was a moral imperative, so they did this. So but all of these human rights treaties with the United States rejected our are not about negative law, they're about positive law. So that's, there is a big difference between the Anglo-American tradition and the continental tradition. That's one of the problems with the International Criminal Court, is it's based on sort of on continental law, it's not based on Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-American laws. It's a totally different uh, judicial system. That's one, it's one, of, one of the problems of having a global rule of law. Is it Anglo-Saxon or is it continental European, is it Chinese? Uh, I'm all for the expansion of international law and, and, and uh, strengthening the rules of law. You can do it with state consent if it can be done effectively where it actually works. I um, wonder if you could comment on the difference between government and governance. Uh, it seems yes. to me like you've been using the terms synonymously. Um, 
Right, and I don't think. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, right. Um, well, governance is sort of a weasel word. It's a way of saying, well, I'm not quite saying there's a government that tells you what to do. So, I mean, the universities, they have universities, right? University governments. So, it's sort of a weasel word that means uh, they're doing a little administrating, but they're not, it's not as strong as the government. <clears throat> we don't want to, it's worth that people don't want to say we're for world government. People said that in 1945, and it sounds like the black helicopters were arriving, and this is part of, of a conspiracy, and Bilderbergs, and Rockefellers, and trilateral commissions, and all that sort of thing. So, no, it's not a world government, it's governance. There's no government, so it's a way of softening. And it's used, as they say, by universities, and some of you know more than I do when universities use the term. So it means you aren't governing, you are administrating, but you're not just the name of that formal government. It's a little weaker type of word. And that's my best try. I mean, somebody who has a better definition. Steve, you have an idea? Well, it's, 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 it's really a way of escaping that way, but yeah. the responsibility that comes with directing a system of government. <laughs> you, you govern without that, and so that's governance. That is weaseling out of it, just accountability. It's, it's a problem. Can we learn anything about uh, how local issues versus uh, the federal issues or higher issues, uh, global issues, are handled by looking at our own civil war? Um, yeah, I don't think it's a direct parallel. Sometimes a parallel is made, and if I'm getting at what you're thinking here, uh, I mean that, that there could be a, a unified Europe, for example. Well, the, the states, the southern states had a particular way that they thought they should govern themselves. Right. And the, the global government of the United States right. decided that that wasn't the way it should be. Right, okay, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, that's a slightly different from what, uh, um, from the goal. it raises some issues of consent. Uh, uh, you can say the argument that, that maybe the most of the southern states were um, probably a majority of citizens. I mean, sure, you had people that weren't citizens, you had slaves and so on. You know, probably not, were not in favor of secession. You had West Virginia break away. You had uh, good parts of Tennessee and Alabama that were uh, on the other side. Um, so you have, you, have, you have an argument about consent. I mean, that's absolutely that's, that's true. Uh, an argument about what constitutes sovereignty. So, a uh, union position was that they couldn't um, break um, unless the commitment of the union was made. They couldn't, couldn't break it. Now, if something happened today, I, we don't, I don't, we're not, we're not gonna, we would not fight for this, I don't think, anymore. I can't imagine the uh, forgiveness would be happening today. So, uh, when uh, the Czechs and Slovaks split, there was no fight. It was the belt of the board. When they broke up Yugoslavia, that was fighting. If there's a break in Bel Belgium, is essentially two countries: the French speaking Belgians and the, Flem the Dutch speaking Flemish. It's the Dutch language. If and when they split, there's not going to be a there's not going to be a fight. Um, so I think yeah, we can look at these. We can take a look at that and see. I'm not sure there's a direct analogy, but there's some, some interesting points. And then you know they, they do have a a, 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 a sovereignty point. That some, 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 some. Um, I have um, one more question. Um, so I think Aristotle wrote that body politic is partly formed by the paideia that it is within the society that decides to form it. So if we look at the European Union, part of the reason that they're having conniption fits to some extent is because the cultures of the northern nations are fundamentally different from those of the south. So to what extent either do the individual cultures of nation states strengthen the opposition to the formation of the transnational system? And as another way of looking at that question, is the transnational system kind of an attempt to erase cultural distinctions between different nations? Yeah, I'd say yes to the final question. I mean, that the, the EU does this explicitly by uh, building up local areas within a country, in Gascony or Brittany or in Scotland, 
in promoting uh, local autonomy and regionalism, they call it regionalism, so promoting regions as a way of undermining the nation states, so they're attempting to undermine the nation states from, from above, from, from the EU, and then below from the, uh, from the center. So they are, they're, yes, there is an attempt to. Also, your other point, I think the cultural base of the nation is extremely important. And that brings up the question, well, couldn't there be a United States of Europe? So, uh, you know, and there technically could be a European nation state. Wouldn't that be like the United States? Well, the United States, um, in the 18th century, this was a country where people spoke the same language, had essentially the same culture, read the same books. The most popular book was, number one book was, was the King James Bible. Uh, number two was about the Bible, Pilgrim's Progress. Um, so they read the same books, they spoke the same language as John Jay wrote in Federalist II, which was, which was already the people. It was already the people, it was already the culture. Uh, yes, there were Germans in Pennsylvania, there were Swedes in, in, in Delaware, there were some there were African slaves, there were people that weren't, uh, they were part of it, there were different, there were some multi ethnic groups. But in the main, there was a broad Anglo American culture, so there was a cultural base that made the Unity and, uh, came out of um, the Federalist Papers, came out of American and the United States, a lot easier than the uh, United States of Europe today. I think the United States of Europe would have been easier after 1945, after the devastation of World War II, and people were talking about the United States of Europe. That might have been more possible then than now. Now, uh, the Northern Europeans in particular have very little to do. If there was a Germany would have the European main support, they would end up being, giving even more money to the Soviet Union. They even have trouble getting to East Germany. Then they had to give it to the southern countries. They're balking at that now. That's what, if they did what Joshka Fischer wanted to do, create a European nation state now, then the Germany would be paying for Finland, would be paying for it. There's tremendous resistance in Finland, in all the northern countries. Uh, that means they would have to be very interested to an election occurring in Sicily, or in Malta. They would have, the Finns would have to be really excited about it. <clears throat> election in Sicily that had to be sort of one political culture, <clears throat> and they're not. They had very distinct uh, cultures, even within Scandinavia. Uh, so I think, yeah, I, agree with that. I think that was almost your original point. And uh, I think those are good points. I guess that brings it to you. From, from, what you're, from what you're saying, I kind of get the impression that uh, the transnational global project is really a Western project, that the yes. deep convictions about this are, are held among Western, European, and American elites. Right, that's correct. And if you take a look at the trend lines uh, in uh, history today, I regret to say this is the director of the Institute of the Study of Western Civilization, uh, that these places are in decline in a variety of ways. Uh, their economies are sluggish, uh, their militaries are, are, are kind of minimal, except in the United States, and that's trending down. Their birth rates are dropping. Um, the future, right now at least, uh, doesn't seem to belong to the parts of the world in which this project is most alive and well. You're sort of suggesting that, that it's latched onto by uh, leaders elsewhere. It's, it's often for opportunistic reasons, and it doesn't really go very deep in terms of the policies that they follow at all. Well, if, if, if that's true, um, what does it say uh, about the future of the project? If uh, in 30 or 40 years we're living in a world in which uh, the great power is in Asia, East Asia or South Asia or Latin America, or if, if the power has migrated uh, to these other centers, what do you think will become of this project? Yes, I said this is a very good question. It was one of the first questions that was raised when I was just starting to write the book. And I answer this in the, in the last chapter of the book, which is um, the suicide of liberal democracy, question of suicide. Um, no, I think this is a utopian project. This particular attempt is not, not going to succeed. I think it will always be with us. I think there will be 500 years from now we'll be talking about what are the guys in there, global government, global peace. There will always be people talking about that. That's never been. But I don't think this project is going to come to fruition as they want it to. Uh, but uh, I think um, the project can do tremendous damage to liberal democracies uh, if its norms are incorporated 
and internalized by elitists has already happened. We can see this on a mini scale in Israel, uh, where they're really having a difficult time even defending themselves because they, they have a, there's a leadership class uh, that has bought into a lot of these notions. Yes, we do have to uh, inform, we do have to warn people before we have a military attack. Yes, you do have to call the Supreme Court of Israel to get permission to carry out a routine uh, military mission. So that's a Western stronghold, and they're already perhaps in the process of it. I'm not sure Israel will exist under Jerusalem now. Uh, so I'd say Iran uh, gets nuclear weapons, so I'm under more pressure. I talked about it. Last trip there, I talked to people. Well, my kids are ready to leave because if this is going to be a real bit dangerous place, particularly this nuclear thing, there's the same any hanging over our heads. I mean, I can go my relatives, I can go to Silicon Valley, and I can stay here. Um, so we'll see. I mean, the Orthodox Jews are having larger birth rates, so it's not the question of it's not like the West. The secular Jews in Tel Aviv are not having all their children, uh, so the. The military thing is becoming more uh, led by modern Orthodox. They're becoming mostly officer corps who uh, are taking a stronger, more military-like stand. So you're having some tensions there. <clears throat> this is part of a, you know, could be a, so I worry about um, the suicide process. No, there, I don't think the global government's people are going to establish the kind of government they want. I worry about it and reacting to it that the West and the United States and Israel and in Western Europe will do tremendous damage to themselves. We've already seen, uh, as I tried to explain in the book, a uh, demotion of democracy in Europe. And uh, one of the terms I think would be helpful because you're, you're the set of Western civilization. There's a good deal of Western, probably the Western intelligentsia today that does not think of itself as Western. They want to move beyond Western. So a good term for beyond Western is post-Western. Even someone like Tony Blair, who uh, as a sort of a defender, in a way of Western civilization, he said, no, we're not Western, just civilization. You could be exclusionary, we're excluding a lot of people, and you know, the Asians and so on, you know, they might be internalized, so it's not really Western, made a point of that. So this is post-Western, after the West, post, after, post-modern, after modern. I think that sort of, it's a, there's a post-Western intelligence, it's part of the government. Uh, uh, so that's, you know, more, more esoteric level. I think you may have answered my question already um, by that last answer. I understood that the EU began as an economic move. The purpose was to create uh, a common market to um, enhance economic strength, improve the economic strength of the member nations. Yes. Governing was a political aspect of government, was a small part of that. It seems to me that over time, the political governing has become a much larger element of the economic union, the European Union. And it also seems to me that uh, any further development of international institutions will have the same kind of life cycle. They may be initiated on improving e economics, uh, the nations that are involved, but soon it becomes more and more political. So we wind up going from any anything resembling a free market to most of the world's economy resembling managed uh, economies. Yes, that's absolutely right. In fact, I have a section in the book uh, where I talk about the transformation of the European Union. I uh, did start with it was all economics, um, and it, this is sort of a model. In fact, they said this. In fact, Jean Monnet, the founding father of the European Union, said, we're going to start, it'll be the United States of Europe Sunday, we're going to start with the economics, and the politics will just gradually, eventually, well, and the whole purpose of the Euro is not economic, it's political. That's the entire purpose of the Euro, is, is to establish the Euro, have, it, have that drive, the discussion that, okay, now we have, now we have a, uh, we have a fiscal union, we need a fiscal union because we have a monetary union. Monetary union is money, but fiscal, we need, need a combined tax policy. Uh, so, yeah, that's absolutely driving it. And the analogy holds uh, with global institutions, and that's why the, many of the strategists say let's do economics first, 
Uh, and that's why, we, that's from an economic, that's why there's a proposal for that. That's why I love enthusiasm for um, the World Trade Organization. So right before the World Trade Organization, Dr. McClass was a GATT, General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. It worked very well, lowered tariffs by 90% from 1945 to 1990. But then they wanted to set up a judicial institution, which sets more integration, judicial integration, as opposed to just nation states being political and talking. But I think all your points are Thank you very much.